When I think about people living in inner city neighborhoods, I think about the principle of equality of life chances. You should not be able to enter a hospital ward in an inner city hospital of newborn babies and predict with near certainty on the basis of their class, background, and race. Where are these kids, where are these healthy newborn babies are gonna end up in life? I don't think people fully understand in the inner city, these kids are making rational choices. I profiled a girl who was like this, a 10-year-old girl. The minute she steps out her front doorway, there are drug dealers out there, no economic opportunity. The school is warehousing her. She doesn't see any prospects. How is she supposed to get out? At the end of the day, when there's not a lot of resources out here and your teachers aren't stressing you to come to class or not even caring, you know, you, you're not gonna go to school. You're gonna sell drugs. You're gonna do what you have to do. Very few people know this, but if you go back and you look at how African-American housing patterns were established in the 30s and 40s, even as a result of the New Deal, the FHA, which was a Democratic New Deal program to inspire home ownership in the midst of the Depression, did more to create ghettos than any other federal program before or since. Why? Because when they were creating the culture of home ownership in America, they were exclusionary to black people. They put them in the areas that were maybe a little bit economically depressed and subject to heavy rentership. And then they redlined those areas and they would not write FHA mortgages in those neighborhoods. Once those areas were redlined, that was basically a design for a ghetto. In 1950, people in these neighborhoods were poor, but they had jobs. By 1960, we're talking about the jobless poor because industries had moved out of the inner city leaving behind concentrated populations of poor people, vulnerable to drug trafficking and all of the other problems associated with joblessness. And what happens when groups are denied access to the core economic engines in a society? They create their own out of prohibited economies. That was true of the Italians and the Irish and the Jews and everybody else who came to the cities a generation before African Americans arrived. We shrugged off so much of our manufacturing base, so much of our need for organized labor, for a legitimate union wage, for union benefits, for the types of jobs on which you could raise a family and be a meaningful citizen. We got rid of so much of that that, oops, we marginalized a lot of white people. One in every eight Americans has had to visit a food bank over the last year. And lo and behold, white people, when they're marginalized, when they are denied meaning, when they're denied meaningful work, they become drug addicts too and they become involved in the methamphetamine trade, and they start turning themselves over to the underground economies that are the only ones there to accept them. Capitalism is fairly colorblind in the end. Our economic engine, when it doesn't need somebody, it doesn't need somebody, it doesn't give a damn who you are. White people found that a little bit later than black folk, but they found it out. I realized that there was a chain of destruction, that what he was talking about could be expressed by links in a chain around the world in more than one society. People do the same things again and again, decade after decade, century after century. Now this chain of destruction begins with the phase we can call identification, in which the group of people is identified as a cause for problems in society. People start to perceive their fellow citizens as bad, they're evil, they used to be worthwhile people, but now all of a sudden, for some reason, their lives are worthless. The second link in the chain of destruction is ostracism, by which we learn how to hate these people, and how to take their jobs away, how to make it harder for them to survive. People lose their place to live. Often they're forced into ghettos where they're physically isolated, separate from the rest of the society. The third link is confiscation. People lose their rights, civil liberties, the laws themselves changed, so it's made easier for people to be stopped on the street, patted down, searched, and for their property to be confiscated. Now, once you start taking people's property away, you can start taking the people themselves away. And the fourth link is concentration. Concentrate them into facilities such as prisons, camps. People lose their rights. They can't vote anymore, they have children anymore. Often their labor is exploited in a very systematic form. The final link in the chain of destruction is annihilation. Now this might be indirect by, say, withholding medical care, or withholding food, preventing further births. 
Or it might be direct, where death is inflicted, or people are deliberately killed. These steps tend to happen of their own momentum, without anybody forcing them to happen. I think a lot of people would be disturbed and outraged by the thought that any part of this process could be going on in America. When all this fighting, alcohol, drugs, all this stuff is going on around this child, who's spo a sponge, who's soaking this up, and you want him to go through all this traumatic, dramatic stuff, and then the next day, I'm supposed to get up and go to school and function like I'm a normal kid, like there's nothing happened. Good morning to you. Good to see you again. Um, my mama had a drug problem, you know, back when I was younger. She wasn't really around like that. And my sister, she was only one year young, older than me, and we kind of looked out for each other. I grew up in a house where it's every man for himself. You know, you got 13 people, but you're living for yourself. You know, I could never buy no food and put it in the refrigerator because people might eat it. And there's been times where I went to the corner store, had to steal food just because me and my sisters, me and my sisters both had to steal food because we ain't had nothing to eat, you know what I mean? And it's been plenty of times where we had to look out for ourselves and we'd be in elementary school, you know what I mean? Nobody processes that with these young people. So they get up the next day and is expected to go and sit in a classroom and they still like traumatized from the night before. And then you want to say, well, why aren't you paying attention and get out of my class and you're not listening. When, we, when, 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 when did we become so desensitized that we can't relate to people?